Botswana, a landlocked country about the size of France and as big as Texas. But that's as far as the similarity goes. A surprising country, sparsely populated, in places arid and bone dry. In others, lush and bristling with plants and animals. A great variety of life, now protected from irresponsible hunting by law. In the Okavango Delta, however, there are areas where hunting is allowed, and it's great hunting. Rough and dangerous, the Okavango is the perfect place to experience the thrill of stalking prey through the heat and dust. You can feel your adrenaline flow. You feel the pulse of the land, the pulse of a creature as it smells danger, as it smells your tired body crouched and waiting. The Okavango Delta lies in the northwest sector of Botswana, fed by the great Okavango River as it courses down from the Angolan Highlands, the water spread moist tendrils across a 6,500 square mile area before disappearing again into desert. The area supports a great multitude of wildlife, but to get anywhere near it, you need experience. The experience that comes from years of hunting, years of successful hunting. Dougie Wright is one such hunter. Dan Petter inside here somewhere? Yes, yeah, I, I am. am. Yeah. Hi, Dan. How do you do? Good to meet you. Well, this is Pom Pom this Airport. Pom Pom International, that's correct. That's right. Yeah. I, I don't think many Lears land here, do they? No, no, no not, not really. Hello. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Dan Pena, world-renowned Bon Vivant and Reconteur. I'd like to welcome you to the beginning of a 15-day hunting safari in the heart of northern Botswana's big game country, the Okavanga Delta. Today is May 1st, 1986. We are in our main camp in Pom Pom, 60 miles northwest of Mount Botswana. With me is Dougie Wright, born and raised in this part of the world, a Botswana citizen. Dougie, who has been a professional hunter for 24 years, will be conducting this hunt. Also with us is Joe Coogan, who will be handling the video camera. What you were about to see was made possible by my loving wife. Doug, tell me about uh, how we're going to uh, handle the safari. Well, first of all, we've got to realize that this is a large inland delta, about 6,000 square miles of it. A lot of it is flooded, and uh, at the moment, a bit dry, but it'll you know, be flooded during our safari. What we will do is we will take off every morning approximately between 7.30 and 8 o'clock, uh, drive down various tracks or cross country looking for sign, any sign, buffalo sign or whatever sign. We will then use trackers to track it down and stalk the animals and shoot them. Would you say that uh, the amount of animals that uh, I've uh, got licenses for is an aggressive program for 15 days? Yes, I would say very aggressive. But one of the things that uh, I'm going to really be able to benefit from uh, being a novice is we're going to have two trucks. Right. We're going to have right. double uh, the, the, uh, the backup that you would normally have on a regular right. safari. Uh, each truck has two trackers uh, and a professional hunter. And in our particular case, we're going to have two um, uh, Sitatunga trackers, one on each truck. So we're going to basically have six trackers. Which, well, uh, this is, uh, in fact, you're going to be hunting Sitatunga on this trip, which... Uh, I think you'll find fascinating, and uh, we're also going to be doing that with uh, with the camera behind you, uh, hopefully to capture the excitement and uniqueness of that kind of hunt. Well, I'm looking forward to it, and uh, never having uh, fired a uh, 375 or or a 270, I'm looking forward to it, especially the 375 uh, in a rocking canoe when we get uh, later on in the safari. Hopefully, I won't fall out and break my neck. Um, Dougie, why don't you show me around and show me how the camp works? Yeah, sure. Let's go. Okay, right that sounds good. Mm -hmm. Bunch of staff here looking after that side. What, what, it, what is the number of staff? I've got five actually personal staff in camp. That's with your cook and your waiter. Two girls and a skin. Uh, Dan, this will be your accommodation for the next 14 nights. Uh, We've moved some of your things in here. Yeah? It's a lot better on heading around to the army, I'll tell you. Dan, here's a basin. This will be filled up every time we come in, so you've got clean water to wash yourself. 
Sounds good. The towel right there. And behind here now is the shower and the toilet. Normal shower rows. Turn it on there. It's adjustable for height. You can move it up and down. Oh, yeah. I'll be done. Little mirror. Little mirror there, yeah. I can see this would be real cozy uh, when it's about 30 degrees. This was made for shorter people. Yeah. Uh, Dan, this is our kitchen area here. That is what you bake your bread. It's a big sort of oven. Okay. And then over here you have this big drum which is filled up with hot water. So when you shower, it's shower water. It goes straight down from there. I see, I see microwave uh, cooking hasn't come to pom pom yet. Not quite yet. No, sir. No. But uh, has it come to mound yet? Yes, we have microwave cooking. Yet. Oh, that's good. One of my plans is to eat everything that I uh, shoot up here. God willing, we shoot a lot. And uh, so uh, crocodile and uh, warthog and uh, buffalo, I'm looking forward. I've never tasted those. So uh, this is the team that will be uh, helping me. And uh, we're going to go out and see what we can accomplish now in the next 15 days. The start of the hunt is a good time to reflect why you're here, what you want from the days ahead. Hunting's more than just shooting. It's a primal experience. You get close to life and death in the raw, close to earth, water, fire and wind, the elements of life. What is this that we're... Uh... Impala. Impala. minutes to accomplish this. Let's hope the rest of the trip is, uh, we have the same luck. In the Okavango, there is a profusion of wildlife that's world-renowned. Many hunters have stalked the bush and come away with magnificent trophies. Buffalo, warthog, tassabi, lion, and wildebeest. Setatunga. Kudu and leopard are rarer finds, but a hunter always hopes must always be ready for the sudden chance, the sudden chase. We're primarily looking for the, uh, the hardest game first, and the easy game will take care of itself, because we keep passing all these things that are supposed to be on my list to shoot, and we don't shoot at them. So I assume because they'll be readily available later on in the trip. Lion is one of the animals on Dan's permit list. These prints have been left by young lions which are too small to be worth hunting. The young male of, of a pride. There's uh, other tracks around here, but this is the, the young male. He's not very big at all, maybe a year and a half, two years old, and that's about it. Still very pronounced there that, you know, we've had points in the older they get, it gets smoother. Which, uh, it's a big How much bigger would a big... Yeah, it's not like that. Yeah, That's the ones that Joe saw yesterday, so we know exactly what they look like. Okay, so we're just going to go on? Yeah, we just carry on. Out. Japanese come on safaris? Yeah, they have. Do they shoot bonsai little, I mean, they, do they want to shoot the little ones? Little bonsai yeah, lions? Yeah. Because anything looks big to them. Getting a hunt going can be difficult. You need to get your sights and taste the territory. Thank <laughs> you. 
Buffalo are widespread across the continent and are no pushovers, being aggressive by nature. Dan shot the buffalo with soft-tipped ammunition, fatally wounding it. In this state, they can be extremely dangerous. The trail was lost, forcing them to track it in the truck so that it's well after sunset when they eventually find the dead beast. Well, we tracked it for about, what, three miles? We crept up to about 60 yards, right, Doug? Yeah, that's correct. About 60 yards, and I shot it on the other side, right about here. And it just spun him around, and he ran off, and then I shot him again on this side, here. And then when we got here, he was on the ground, he was still alive, and then I shot him again in the chest. And uh, add a little excitement, my gun jammed. Gun jammed. Gun jammed, and I couldn't get a shell in, and uh, Doug's running ahead of me, and I'm trying to get the fucker to work, and it wouldn't work. And so he's a good, good way to get us killed. So he, he fell back, and he unjammed it, and then we continued, and we found him. Why but, was the uh, gun jamming? I, I put in the bullets backwards. Yeah. Not backwards, but um, the wrong well, side. The the yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. But uh, kind of looks like my mother-in-law. Oh. Another day in the jungle. <laughs> Not that that's often. Yeah, and we'll be home by midnight. Yeah, that's right. If we're lucky. If we're lucky? Jeez, look at those fucking bones. Breakfast, and time to plan the day ahead. The mood is optimistic. A crocodile has been seen in the vicinity. This animal, a throwback to prehistoric times, has not changed for millions of years. Soft ammo has a silver bullet head designed to flatten out on impact. Good for crocodiles, as they often do not die when shot. They just get angry. This should be a skull shot? Yeah, it's definitely a brain shot. What we do is just get your gun ready and we'll stalk up about another hundred yards and get into position hoping that he'll be lying up there. It's ideal weather for it and he should be out of the water by now. Got to keep real low now. <laughs> the crocodile just on the other side of this bush. Let's go in very quietly and low. Okay, let's go. Sneak out of here and try and make him bring his head up. Shooting into the cold water is the most effective method of scaring away the other crocs, so Doug can swim over and tie a rope around the 1500 pound monster. Well, I think, uh, what do they call it? A. Uh... Weatherby Crescent. A Weatherby Crescent, I think. And your excitement, you got too close to the scope? Yeah. How's it taste? A little Tasty. salty? A little salty, but not bad. Eat some cheese and crackers with it. Looks like you can use a couple of stitches, but we'll just pack some mud in there and it should be all right. Yeah, should be. One, two, and three in the eye. Well done, that's some good shooting there. They make sure the creature is dead before Dan does this trick. He wouldn't be the first to lose his head in this way. It will tell the guys that they don't have to, they don't have to pay the girls in camp for pussy anymore. They got this. 
Yeah, I think it's a female. It feels that. good. The native woman hides her baby from the camera as she cleans the last strips of Dan's buffalo meat. Mmm, it's good eating. I can't believe there's nothing left of the buffalo. Is that food for a month? Is that food for a month? That goes back to the wide and short for a second, huh? We can unload this bastard now? Let's get at it. Once you've got the crocodile, the prize is his hide. It must be kept wet and salted until it can be tanned. The problem for Dan is what to do with the hide once it's tanned. He can't bring it into the US or Britain. There are rules against importing crocodile skins. At present, the hide is still in Africa. You know, they're very superstitious people, and of course they use the liver, the witch doctors use the liver and the brains, which are very highly poisonous, highly toxic, and they have used them in, in ritual murders, so traditional crocodile is regarded as taboo. Hunting isn't just about killing, it's about the chase. There are fine threads of danger and fear here that enmesh the country. Trip on one, snap one, and your prey disappears. Wildebeest sense any movement in this fine web and run. They run because there's nothing they can do against a bullet. They run, and you have to chase. The kill is only the final moment of triumph. To kill, you've got to catch, and to catch, you've got to tail the beast. That needs skill, intelligence. You've got to know a continent like your own backyard. The kill is only the final moment. It's the hunt that counts. We couldn't get close enough to him. They spotted us from the very beginning. shoots twice, hitting the wildebeest in the lungs. It still runs before collapsing. It's a record-breaking kill. The unwanted parts of the animal are left to the vultures. All part of the food chain, they will strip a dead animal to the bone in 20 minutes. The trackers have found a baby crocodile. It's only six feet long, so for some fun, they put a rope around it. But they can't get it off again. Shorty braves the fearsome jaws by standing on its head. The croc is not impressed. Dan has shot a second buffalo. Badly wounded, it runs off. Blood on a leaf leads them to the beast. It's another record. Weighing 2,200 pounds or a ton, 
This buffalo measured 42 inches across the horns. I hit it six times. Five in the backhand and one in the chest. And they tell me this is a pretty good sized buffalo. <coughs> So now the real hunt begins, the hunt for kudu. Ernest Hemingway hunted a single kudu for three months. No wonder he was inspired to write about the grey ghost of Africa. Stealing through the country like a spirit, ash grey against the shadowy chaos of light and shade, he disappears, reappears, making the hunter nervous, twitching behind his gun sight. This thick brush area that we're going through right now, looking for kudu, um, is uh, wrought with trees that have been, been pushed down by elephants. This tree is about 16 or 18 inches in diameter, and they push them down and then they eat uh, the leaves and the shrubs at the end of the tree. Uh, the water, it doesn't rain again, so the water get here, this pond will evaporate and these catfish will die. It's more like mud than water. One of the, uh, the best things about the safari system, at least here in Africa, is that for, I think a throwback from the British is the way we have lunch with a tablecloth and napkins. Now the professional hunter that's uh, doing the filming has a real technique for lunch. He takes a slice of bread and he puts it down then he puts on maybe beans and then maybe onions and then maybe some other junk and three or four or five layers and then he smooshes it all around and then he starts to eat it and then he tops it off with a couple of cokes and then a couple of pieces of bread with uh, cheese he's a cheese freak and he I think the only complaint he's got is that they need better quality cheese here um, actually when I decided to come on the safari I didn't think we'd be eating like this. I didn't know we were going to have showers and the state of the camp was going to be as nice. So I was pleasantly surprised. So far today, in fact, the safari is exactly half over today at lunch, seven and a half more days, and we've uh, collected some uh, very good trophies. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what they look like um, on, uh, on walls. And right now we're going to concentrate on lion and kadu for the next couple of days, and then pretty soon we'll be going up to the uh, river country, and um, hopefully we'll get the rest of the game that uh, we've got scheduled, which is five or six others. Burned about a week ago. Uh, I asked if it had been burned by the government, and uh, Doug said no. It's against the law to burn. And I asked if this was good for the game, and he said what will happen in a few days. It'll grow back, and it'll grow back green, and so game will come back into this area. And if you'll notice, none of the trees burn, only the grass. So we're going to go out and then cut across and still looking for our, our gray ghost of Africa. Morning of the 10th day. At the end of today, the safari will be two thirds over. The last couple of days, um, we've been uh, sighting kudu, but uh, so far, we've never been able to get a clear shot or get close enough to get a, even a bad shot. And uh, I now appreciate why they call him the Great Ghost of Africa. Hopefully, our, our luck is going to change today. I'm bringing along my Rambo knife for good luck. The um, where, Doug, where are we going to go? We're morning? going up on the northern islands, and then cut west, come back on the islands through our, the burn that we were on yesterday, and then back to the South Island. As I've noted in my diary, when the safari first started nine days ago, and I shot two real good trophies the first day and we sighted two and we were shooting at least one a day that uh, I expected something like this because I expect this is what safari life is really like isn't it? That's correct. Yeah. So we sighted a, a number of lion. We saw some lion yesterday, two lionesses and one young male. So hopefully if we keep seeing enough lion we'll see a pretty good sized male so we'll get a good shot at that. In the meantime we're going to pick after the kudu. The lead tree is 2,000 years old, a living fossil. The kudu has been spotted again.
Doug and I and a couple of tractors are going to go out right now. And we're going to leave most of the other people behind. If he turns back into the wind, then we're going to pull the trucks up and we're going to keep circling, see if we can find him. We'll have a little better luck than I missed shot from last time. Dan missed. The gray ghost escaped to live another day. But a herd of zebra was sighted. Dan shoots a large male. Apparently, have gotten confused, so we're going to go back at the origin because our tracks should have blood trailing, and the tracks that we're on through now apparently don't have blood. So we're going to go back a ways and then go forward. I think I hit him uh, middle center. One of the realizations of coming to Africa takes a whole lot to kill these fuckers. We tracked it for about 30 minutes and then we discovered we probably lost the tracker on the wrong track. We backed up, found the blood again, tracked again as I said a few minutes ago. Then we spotted it again and I shot it in the uh, back left side and then it hobbled away and then I shot it again and apparently I must have broken its leg because then it was limping. But it's interesting, the kinds of things that they were picking up to track were like as small as a leaf. I picked one up for my scrapbook, this big with a spot of blood on it. And uh, we found a number of those, and then finally a puddle where it apparently had stopped for a moment. But as Dougie has been telling me, the wildebeest, the zebra, and the buffalo just don't want to die. They just don't want to die. And uh, we saw spotted a leopard just before this, and I couldn't see because I thought it was a kudu, so I kept looking high about up here. And all the trackers were, they're dragging me up, and trying to drag me up high enough so I could see. And the leopard was down here. By the time I saw it, I couldn't get a shot at it, so I shot like this, and I missed it. And the boys, and it was about, what, eight, ten yards ten from, the, yards, front of, yeah, from yards. the front of the car. So I'm kicking myself for that. So now I'm going to have to learn, when I view, view up and down. Just because I'm always after kudu right now, <laughs> gray ghost, up here, I've got to look down lower. And this big hunk of shit. What do you do with these? Uh, Skin them out. But uh, they don't use the. Fur, they don't. Can't you make a rug out of that? That's beautiful rug. That's what you make. Yeah. Skin out the whole thing for a rug instead of a head mount. I wouldn't use a head mount. Okay. I'd skin the whole thing, so you'd have a whole skin. It looks lovely. Okay. Instead of the head? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's such a great no. yeah, mount. Plus, my children probably think I should shoot the horses now. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'd skin it out full for a for a thing. A rug. Okay. Is this a relatively big one? This is a very very big zebra. Yeah. About 900 pounds, eh? So we're going to try to get a kudu in the afternoon. God willing, shout yeah. out Mungo, as we say. Yeah, well, we, we broke the uh, two and a half day dry spell. Now that we've got blood in our eye again, let's see if we can do some damage or something else. I hope it falls down easy, this next one. Jesus. Look at that. Hey, maybe he got his nuts off at the end. Well, they're finishing uh, full skinning the zebra. I've decided to make a rug out of it instead of mounting it like the rest of the things. And uh, I decided that uh, perhaps something was wrong with the uh, sight on the 375 because I missed the kudu low in the belly this morning and I hit the zebra first shot low, although it did pass through and come close to its heart on the other side. So I came out here with Joe Coogan to practice. And we set up on this with his coat all bundled up and he put a mark where I was supposed to fire. And I got up right next to it and as Dougie says, I crawled up the weapon. I got my eye right up to the sight. And I fired, and I cut myself under my eye, across my nose, and over my eye. Now, not being a fast learner, I not only did it as I did the time before three times, I did it four times in a row, cutting my eye in a neat little circle on both sides of my bridge of my nose. And uh, in the second cutting of this tape, it's going to be because the zebra reared back on its hind legs and hit me 
with one of his hooves as I shot him in the heart. It's like being tickled to death with a dove feather. Yes, exactly, exactly. The Delta has become lush. It's surprising to think that a few hours ago, this area was dry. More and more game will be coming into the territory. More opportunities to hunt. We're going to swing back towards camp, and we're going to try to see if we can find a kudu or some signs of what we've got left on our list, which are basically um, lion, leopard, sitatunga, kudu, and tesabi. The kudu has been spotted again. Being a territorial rather than a herd animal, they know it's the same one. And this time, the wind's in their favor as they move in. of Africa. How much do you think he weighs? About 600 pounds. If uh, we weren't going to shoot this animal, as you can see, we've got enough backup. We were going to wrestle the asshole down to the ground, and I was going to cut his throat with my Rambo knife. But we didn't have to do that. These ears remind me of um, the Prince of Wales, because he's got big ears. Maybe I'll send him a picture. And uh, one of the reasons we had trouble with him is these ears, these big things that looks like, look like loaves of bread on the sides of his head. He can hear for miles and miles, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna probably ask for the whole skin so we can make something else with the rest of the skin, and we're gonna mount him about to here. Yeah, that's right. Now, one of the uh, comments that was made by Joe Coogan, he said that this was a classic hit right in the heart, just uh, behind this leg, down a ways, and it's only the second animal I made I've aimed at there, and the only other one was the buffalo on the run. The second shot I hit the buffalo. And normally, I aim here, in the middle, because most, of the, most North American animals, that gives you most margin for error, and they all fall down. Whereas, I'm learning uh, quickly that the African animals, with a much greater survival instinct, unless you hit them right there, or unless you hit them here, and you don't want to hit this one here, because you knock the uh, horns off, they just keep living. It was about a 125-yard shot, and he moved about how many yards before he dropped? Uh, 30 yards. And that was still, is that his heart? Yeah, that's his heart. Yeah. Right in the heart. One of the things that I was worried about just before I pulled the trigger was hitting these. Hunting on dry land is fine. You soon get used to that. But to get Sitatunga, you've got to go into the half world of the marshes. You have to sit in canoes where you've nowhere to rest your rifle. This terrain is pretty hard, but the Sitatunga's worth it. The animal has long hooves so that it can move with ease and speed through the terrain. It spends most of its time hiding away in the vegetation. At the best of times, it's hard to find. They're about 45 miles out from camp, and there's great rivalry between the trackers on each canoe to be the first to spot a male. Dan has missed a small male, the trackers spot another. Dan shoots, missing several times due to the unstable canoe. But the next three shots hit home and the prize is hit. A short stop on an island to view the beast before canoeing back and the long, bumpy drive back to camp. You know, it, it's funny how the, uh, when I missed the little Sitatunga male, or medium-sized one, 
I mean, they looked at me like I was made out of dog shit. I mean, glory is fleeting. Now I'm a fucking hero. Shorty came and kissed my hand. He says, I'm number one, number one. So I'm number one as long as I, I, I knock him out and if I, if I even have a draw, I'm, I'm not even on the list anymore. The safari is all but over. The last day, and still no large lion or leopard. So the group stays near to camp. It's heart of palm for lunch, courtesy of Shorty. Well, Dan got most of the animals on his list, achieving three new records in hunting. Panning from left, my left to my right. Little reed buck. Nobody wants to hold the reed buck. Another buffalo. Let's see, um, kudu, um, wildebeest, warthog. Nobody wants to hold a warthog either. Um, let's see, uh, Sitatunga, uh, impala. No, lechwe than impala. And uh, all of those animals weigh a lot more than they look now. Look like they've been on a pritikin diet. And um, normally these guys talk shit, but right now they're being very quiet. <laughs> so tell them to say goodbye to the... Uh... <laughs> and now it's time to leave, until next time. The safari's over, but the instinct remains. There's something basic about hunting, something that comes from your bones, something that is a part of you. When you're out there in the thick of this primal web of life and death, you feel alive. You feel the pulse of a powerful world. You feel you're part of the animal kingdom.